all for joining us. We have got our recording started and I will introduce myself first. I am Jessica Rohr. I am the member engagement and communication specialist here at Hattie Trust. And I use she, her pronouns. I'm excited to be facilitating today for Eric's presentation on how to read a whole Hattie Trust collection. So before we turn it over to Eric, I've got a little bit of housekeeping to take care of. So Eric, if you'll lead us into the next slide there. As I'm sure you know, if you've joined Hattie Trust events before, all Hattie Trust events adhere to this code of conduct. Melissa is going to put that in the chat and we thank you in advance for making this a safe and comfortable space for everyone attending. Next slide, please. This is old hat for everybody, I'm sure. But just in case, little refresher on Zoom, everyone who has joined today has been automatically muted. We would prefer that you keep your microphone and video off. We do have a fairly large audience today and it just makes it easier. Um, we will be using chat for questions. So if you have questions, feel free to drop them in at, at any time. We will get to those and then Eric will guide us through um, other, other points at which he is available to answer some questions. Um, we are recording and we also have made available the live transcript. I believe that is working. If somebody is looking for that and it is not, please jump in on the chat and let us know. Um, Melissa Stewart is my colleague today who is helping us. So if you have run into any technical difficulties, um, give her a shout in chat and we can help you with that. Go to the next slide. As I said, we will be using chat for the Q&A. So just keep the conversation going in that space. And next slide, Eric. Finally, Please give us a shout out on social media. We'll be using this hashtag all week long. You can add us at Hattie Trust. Um, we also, as a side note, you might have seen, we are playing a little Hattie Trust bingo this week. We've got some OG original swag um, from Hattie Trust. If you complete your bingo card, you will get some swag. So Melissa's gonna drop that link in the chat as well. And with that, I am going to turn this over to Eric. Hello, everybody. My name is Eric Morgan. Thank you for participating today. Um, I work at the University of Notre Dame uh, in the libraries, and I work in a digital scholarship center. Um, when you figure out what digital scholarship is, please tell me. And uh, what I do is I provide text mining and natural language processing services to the uh, university community. Uh, what does that mean? That means I help people read bunches and bunches of text. What my presentation today is about is how to use this same sort of process to read the whole of a Hadi Trust collection. Um, and on this first slide is everything you need to know about how to read a Hadi Trust collection. I'm going to uh, discuss each one of these uh, things. I'm going to go very quickly. Um, and then I hope that takes less than 10 minutes. And then uh, and then I will stop for a Q&A. And then I will try to do some demonstrations. Everything, every time you do a computer demonstration, something goes wrong. And then I hope to have some more Q&A and we will be finished, famous last words, before noon. Okay? On my mark, get set, go. The Hadi Trust is a, a really cool resource. Uh, you know, it, it, it's just got bunches of stuff in there, lots of good stuff. And you can search the trust and you can create a collection of items. That's absolutely wonderful. But your collection of items might be very large. This presentation will describe how you can get your brain and your mind around such a large collection. The first step in this process is to articulate a research question. Well, you can see them there, and I'm going to talk about them in depth in the next slides. The first step, 
uh, is you have to articulate some sort of research question that if you don't articulate a research question against your, your collection, you're never going to be satisfied. That if you don't know where you're going, you're never going to get there. Uh, but your research question can be extraordinarily simple, just to entertain me or just tell me about. But it can also be as complex as what is love? How did St. Augustine define love? And how can that be compared and contrasted with uh, Rousseau? Uh, these questions can range from the, from the mundane to the sublime. And for the purposes of this presentation, I want to ask the answer the question, how did Ralph Waldo Emerson define what it means to be a man? The first step in the uh, process is to actually click the correction, collection. This is easy. Go to the trust, search, 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 mark items of interest, add or create those items to a collection, and repeat until you get tired. That's not too difficult. That's very easy, actually. But once you create a collection, it's entirely possible that you'll have many duplicates. And, um, uh, and it's important to refine your collection. This process is a little bit more difficult. Um, I advocate the use of a tool called Open Refine to do this. Uh, you open, open, refine. Uh, you import the collection file. I convert the dates to numbers, and then I facet on the result and remove the unwanted ones. I edit cluster on the author values, and then I facet and filter on those values and remove the unwanted ones. I edit cluster on the title values, uh, I filter and facet on those, remove the unwanted items. Uh, you go to step four, actually I want to go to step two, uh, until you're satisfied, repeat, 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 and then you export the result as a tab delimited file, which is what you got in the first place. The next thing is, uh, now that I have a great big bibliography, I actually need to get the items. How am I actually going to get these things? Well, I could sit there at the trust window and I could click, 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 and download all those things. And that would be good for a couple of items. But if you have like more than five, 10 items, 15, 100, 200 items, that's going to get real tedious real fast. And that's why that's what the Hottie Trust Data API is for. And I wrote a program called HTID to books, which uh, automates the whole process. Now, after you've downloaded all the good stuff, you need to create a data set out of it. You need just a whole pile of text and a bunch of bibliographies isn't really enough. You're going to want to know things like what words exist in your corpus, what nouns exist in your corpus, what named entities exist in your corpus, what the grammars are like, uh, what the collocations are like, do the things fall into clusters or not? And uh, to do all that good work, you need to create a data set. You need to create uh, a collection of content that is uh, computable. Uh, uh, and so that's the next step in the process. And I wrote another program called the Reader Toolbox that's intended to do that. And now I have a computing, a computable uh, data set and I can actually do computation against it and actually begin to answer my research questions. And I might um, evaluate the, the content based on its extent. How big is it? How many words does it have? I might want to do a feature reduction against it in various types of clustering like topic modeling. I might want to do information retrieval that includes concordancing, uh, full text indexing, and maybe querying an SQL-like database. Or I might model the whole content based on grammar and semantics. And doing those various, uh, all those various things will help you answer your research question. So uh, this is the briefest of things. And so I've done all that. And these are some of the things that uh, Emerson thinks uh, what man is. He's a, a golden impossibility. He's a god in ruins. And he's a real pain in the butt when he's separated on ships, mines, in colleges, and monasteries. Um, you can answer these sorts of questions. Uh, and then finally, uh, the last step is go back to step one, because this process is never really done. And uh, it, it should raise more questions rather than not. So you have to go back to step one. And this is where I do the live demonstration thing, but I'm gonna stop my sharing. And 
I don't know if you can see me or not. And now is a good time for some Q&A. On your mark, get set, go. And, and Jessica, are you going to moderate those questions? Yep, Melissa is going to pick those up. So if you've got questions, you can put them in the chat. Um, if you would rather speak out loud, we can make that happen too. Someone has to have a question. I have a question. Um, <clears throat> Excuse me, I was just <laughs> having a bite of a muffin. Um, could you please um, explain why you use that particular question in this demo? Like, I think you chose that for a reason and you said you can't really answer that question well with this. Can you say more about that? Uh, yeah, I'm a humanist. Uh, I'm very much a, a, a liberal arts kind of person. I'm very interested in very big ideas. What is love? What is justice, honor, truth, beauty, philosophy, science, religion? Uh, what does it mean to be a man? Uh, it's interesting uh, to, to see and compare and contrast what the definition of it is to be a man, a person, a woman uh, throughout time. It's, it's just something that interests me. Uh, to elaborate though, one of the things that, um, <clears throat> uh, uh, this sort of process can do is answer newspaper like newspaper reporter like questions. It's really good at answering who, what, when, uh, where, and how many, but uh, it's really difficult to use a computer to answer why questions. Um, and besides that, um, if I were to sit a bunch of people around and we were all to read various works and then we would discuss, well, what does it mean to be human? We would all come up with different answers. Uh, the computer is like that too. It's not going to give you definitive answers. It's going to give you uh, actually more questions than not and, and food for discussion. I picked it because it was a cool question. Thanks. Um, I was just curious if people tend to come to you with that type of question and you need to steer them to no. <laughs> um, different methods or... Okay. No, no. When people come to me with questions like, how is this translation of the Psalms different than that translation of the Psalms? Uh, to what degree does the totality of Confucian literature uh, embodied in the history of Confucian, uh, of, of Chinese thought? Um, here's uh, 600,000 tweets. Uh, help me figure out to what degree there's a real conversation going on here, or is everyone just talking past each other? Those are the sorts of questions people usually ask me. Thanks. Another one. We do have a question. Um, how much uh, coding experience must one have to be able to use these tools? Uh, what is the minimum skill level? Zero. There's no... Uh, in the things that I'm going to show today, you do not write software, but uh, you do work from the command line. And like everything else, it requires practice. It's not hard. It's not rocket surgery, but it does require practice. Uh, now, if you want to write software against it, that's even better, but that's not necessary. And I, I hope to show that to you soon. One more. Oh, I see a couple things in chat. So maybe there's a couple of questions. Um, how do you determine what texts to include in your collection based on your research question? <laughs> That's up to you. Um, in this particular case, <clears throat> I, uh, I searched uh, the totality of, of um, uh, the trust for things authored by Mr. Emerson and then to make my life easier, I limited it to full text items, and I also limited it to items that are in the Harvard Library. Uh, but that's a that's not a computing problem. Uh, a person has to come up with a research question and then identify sets of text that they think are going to answer that question, uh, and, and that's a that's a very difficult step. That's a that's a good question. How do you do that? Uh, information literacy. One more. 
Um, are your tools to handle non-Roman script language materials? Not yet, no. Right now, the things I can demonstrate are really only do English. That's a good, that's a good, that's a very good question. Okay, I'm gonna to try to do uh, the Q&A, uh, the demonstration thing. And every time you do this, uh, something goes wrong. So let's see, I have to do my share screen. I'm gonna share my desktop. I'm thinking, and hopefully you see stuff. Participants can now see your screen. And then what I'm going to do is I'm gonna open up um, a web page. I created a verbose version of this thing. Uh, and uh, the link is at the very end of the slides. And I'm going to elaborate on these things. So you have to articulate a research question, and then you're going to create a collection. And I did that good work. <clears throat> and here is, uh, my, here is my, my collection that I created. And as you can see, it has many, many items in it. How many? 317. And if I download those particular things, I download those particular things, I end up with this file that, uh, that Good Tr Trust sends me. And they, you said, it sends it to you as a TXT file, but it really is a tab delimited text file and therefore op openable in any spreadsheet or database application. So my thing is thinking about opening it. Come on now, open up. And this is my raw collection file. It has a high trust identifier, access rights, lots of bibliographic control numbers, uh, titles, authors, dates, and all this sort of good stuff. There's 300 items in here, uh, and Mr. Mr. Emerson did not write 300 things. So what you have to do is you have to um, refine them. And I've done that here by opening up Open Refine, and I'm gonna choose my files. It's gonna be this one. And I just say, go, 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 go. All the defaults are just fine. Go, create my project. <clears throat> it's thinking. And for example, I might go over here to my author field and I might edit that and I don't need all this nice cataloging information. So I can just delete all those things and change them all. And then I can do a find for those sorts of things. I'm gonna look for Mr. Emerson. And I should uh, see it finds them, and then I can uh, star them. Say, for example, star all these things. Uh, let's see, facet transform. I'm just going to star them. Can I star that? Uh, edit rows, star rows. Great. And then I can remove this, and then I can facet on the stars, facet on the stars, and there are uh, 200 of them that are fat starred and. At 37 that aren't. And if I look at those, I should see that there's other authors, Margaret Fuller, Thoreau, and I don't want any of these things. So, because I only want things written by Mr. Emerson and I can say something like uh, remove matching rows and I move all, and I now I have only 280. And you repeat this process over and over and over again against your collection and you export the result and you end up with a new tab delimited text file, which has much fewer items in it, only 21. And this set of items is pretty much representative of what Mr. Emerson wrote. Uh, and I, the goal now uh, is to actually get these particular things. So I've got this nice hottie trust number here and all these things are, are uh, freely available. So then what I can do is I can, I don't need this file, as I can open up my terminal, ACK, opening up a terminal. And I can type in or download a program called uh, High Trust of Books. And I type in collections uh, to books and it comes back and it says, well, I need a TSV file. And I said, okay, that's fine. And I'm gonna give it my TSV file that I just created. And I say, go, oh, I did. And what it's doing, is it's looping through each item in the collection file, finding each page in each item and downloading those things from the trust, looping through until it says there's no more, no more pages, 
determining how many pages were actually downloaded. So, so far there's at least 117 pages in this particular item. And then it will do the same thing for uh, JPEG images, download each JPEG image of the uh, trust item. Uh, and in both cases, it will concatenate everything that it finds together and it will create a set of PDF documents and we'll do that for each item in the collection. Um, you go, gosh, that kind of takes a long time. Well, yes, it does. Uh, and it takes a long time because uh, one is only authorized to download uh, things a page at a time, not the whole process. Now I could do it via the web, uh, but that would be a lot of click, 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 click. When you're done with this, I'm gonna control C this. See, it, it created a file, now it's downloading the JPEG images of that same thing. I'm doing control C. And when I do that, I end up with two giant directories. One is plain text versions of my things. I'm just gonna open, open, randomly open up one of these. And here's all the OCR of a book. And then I can go back and I can get open up a PDF version of a book. And so, uh, well, you can see that there's the book there, I promise. <laughs> I promise. Okay, so I have a bibliography, my collection file. I have the actual content. And if a more traditional way, you might go about and start reading those items uh, by printing them out or looking them on your screen and it would read, 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 read. But the process isn't very scalable. Uh, and so you might wanna create a, a, a data set from it. So I've written another program called the Toolbox. And after you install that, I can type RDR for reader. And then I'm going to build a collection. And for this case, I'm just gonna call it foobar. And then I want it to have the content of my text files. In this case, I'm dragging this over here to my little window. And I'm gonna say, I'm gonna start up Tika and erase anything that it was already there and go. And what happens is that the underlying software fires up a Tika server, which is the secret sauce. That is a Tika is a really cool application. It extracts PDF, it extracts text from PDF documents. It figures out what language things are. It will try to extract metadata from PDF documents. It's a really good program. It's doing its thing uh, and it's creating a Carol. Uh, it's reading as many of these items and processing as many of these items as you have available on your computer, your cores. Um, I have eight cores on my machine, so it's reading eight at a time. Um, and believe it or not, it's actually doing it. And, but if you had to read 21 books, it would take you a long time too. I'm going to control C out of this because I've already done that. And I'm going to go back to my little web page. Not that one. <clears throat> so I've articulated my research question. I've created the collection. I refined my collection. I downloaded the full text. I built, and then I built a, a data set. I call them study carols. You know, those little boxes in libraries where you bring all your books to and you put them in there and you do your good work. And I call them study carols. And after you've done your study carol, you can actually begin to address your research question. I'm gonna make my font bigger. One of the first things that you're gonna to wanna to do is you're gonna to wanna to know how many items are in your collection. And in this particular case, there are 21. And more importantly, you need to know how big the corpus is in words. This particular corpus is 1.7 million words long. Well, you go, well, that doesn't tell me much. Well, Moby Dick is about 0.2 million words long. War and Peace is about half a million words long. And the Bible is about 0.8 million words long. So we're trying to read a corpus that's about uh, two times bigger, uh, a little bit more than two times the size of a Bible. I, and I can do this. RDR reader info and the study carol I created previously was called Emerson works. Oh, Emerson works. And I can see here, let me make it bigger. I have 21 items and there's about uh, 1.7 million words long. There's other details in there, but our time is limited. 
This is also a good time to look at a bibliography of the thing. Each bibliog bibliographic item uh, has a shape that looks like this. So you get author title date, how big it is, how difficult it is to read. There's a computed summary. The reader will create a computed summary against your documents. It tries to extract uh, what it calls statistically significant keywords. Those are akin to subjects. And you can see where your item is actually located on your, on your hard drive. So if I take this, say for example, and then I go back to my terminal and I say, open that file, I end up with that particular file on my machine. Yay. So let's look at the bibliography. I didn't say it was pretty, but here's a little bibliography and you'll notice that each item is a Hathi Trust ID. And it tells me all about those particular things. Okay. Now, that's one way to model your text. You can also get an idea of how the whole thing works by summarizing the whole thing. RDR summarize Emerson works. That will think it's recreating the bibliography, it's recreating the sizes, and it's gonna create a very generic uh, HTML page that describes the, the whole content. It's thinking. Again, if you had to read 1.7 million words, it would take you a long time too. I think it's important to note that the, all these various things are different ways to model the text, looking at the text in different ways, different shapes. Once it creates its summary, you can read it. RDR, read, Emerson works. And it makes this generic HTML page uh, saying, uh, you know, where did it come from? Uh, I can see here that the, the, the sizes of the things uh, have an averages of scores, but there's no really big ones or really small ones. Uh, the readability is pretty easy. 80, 100 means everybody can read it. Zero means nobody can read it. Uh, 80 is a pretty very readable score. Here's this thing called clustering. Uh, if it does feature reduction against it, it thinks that, that maybe the whole corpus falls into two piles. Now we don't know what those two piles are yet. It's simple counts and tabulations. What are the unigrams? What are the bigrams? What sorts of nouns uh, appear a lot? What sorts of uh, uh, proper nouns and pronouns appear a lot? What, are the, what do they do? What are the lemmatized verbs? So in this particular case, he describes things that see and have and say and know and make. Novels have an awful lot of say. Here's adjectives, adverbs, uh, named entities. These are real things. So what are the people, places, organizations that are mentioned? And then here's the little, little uh, uh, word cloud illustrating the keywords. This is one way to model your text by very, very simple, uh, very, very simple frequencies. I'm getting there, we're gonna answer, but notice that the word man and men is often in here. So I think we'll be able to answer our question, what is a man? We might have to then cluster our results. I've done this with these various reader commands here and I've already echoed this. There might be uh, two very broad clusters, but we don't know what they are. If we do topic modeling against it with only two topics, we get this topic, man, and another one, called English, man is very big score, English is small, and the, both those topics are elaborated upon with these words. And if you do the pie chart thing, you can see most of the content is about man, whatever that means, and only a quarter-ish is about English. And once you topic model those things, you can uh, add metadata to your topic model, and these are titles, these are each one of the titles in my 21 collections. And you can see to what degree does each title talk about man, whatever that means, and English. And here's these journals he wrote. And a lot of his journals talk about English, whereas the other things talk a lot about man. Okay, so we're getting there. We're getting there. We're not seeing themes like art. We're not seeing themes like science and biology. We're not seeing themes like God, okay? Uh, we can also do 
uh, simple information retrieval against our content. And a concordance is one of the best ways to do that. Here I concordance against the text and I simply look for the phrase man is. And so the man is a noble stoic, he's a robin, man is a fish, good man is obedient. You know, it just gives you an idea of what's going on. Here's a list of all the concordance values. So I'm beginning to answer the question, what is a man? Scroll, 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 scroll. You can also look for this phrase, man is or men are, in a full text index uh, using this search command. And every, almost every single one of the pieces contain those phrases, but it returns the list in a relevancy ranks order. And the document that is most relevant is a title called Representative Men, which is really all about what it means to be. A, uh, he, he outlines and discusses what seven different men are. And my little thing isn't loading my book, that's okay. We can also model our texts and read the corpus based on grammars. This is very interesting. You can assign each word a part of speech value, noun, verb, and adjective, and then different combinations of nouns, verbs, and adjectives make up, uh, 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 make up our grammars. And then you uh, uh, combine those grammars to create sentences, and you hope to high heaven that the sentences that you create are semantically correct and actually have some sort of meaning. Well, that's what the reader does. I can uh, apply these grammars against my corpus, and I'm going to do what's called a semi-structured sentence. I'm going to look for a noun uh, uh, in the, the, the beginning of the sentence. I'm going to look for the, a flavor of the word to be, and I'm going to sort the result. And this is a terse description of what men are. It found all sorts of sentences that match that particular grammatical question. Beggars, a channel, a consumer, a scholar. Here's the whole list. And what's cool about this is that there's many different versions of the verb be. Being, can be, are, is, was, and it finds all those things. And again, it gives me an idea of what uh, Emerson thought a man was. That's all very well and good, but these sorts of things are snippets. They're not sentences and therefore they're not complete ideas. So another idea is to extract all the sentences from the carol that have this flavor, a noun phrase, a predicate, and then a noun phrase. Whole piles of meaningful sentences. And then you can loop through all those sentences where man is in the noun phrase or some variation of man, and then the B, and then if it matches that, then I can output those sentences. So here I have more definitions of what it means to be a man. A golden possibility, there's the rude bear. Human life and its persons for poor and porical pretensions. And I can do this here. And I, here's all the sentences that match that pattern where there's a noun phrase, the predicate be, and then another noun phrase. So these things are more semantically sound and more meaningful. Another cool way to do it though, is to ask a question. Uh, 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 so you do the same sort of thing, you extract all the, all, all the sentences, and then you ask a question like, what is a man? What is a great man? And instead of looking for the gram gram grammars, which you've sort of already done, you look for sentences that uh, match those particular questions closely, and you can measure the similarity and differences between sentences with lots of different types of things. Like there's this Levantia Stan uh, algorithm, you can use uh, Euclidean distances, you can use a cosine distance, you can use a Manhattan distance, and you end up with things like this. A good man differs from God. The great man is a great statue. And here's all my answers, and they're really ugly. But if I save this on my desktop as grammars, and then I open it up in my favorite spreadsheet program, I can see that uh, I have these various measures and then the actual sentence. And if I sort this one by, I think it's a sending order, 
every great man is a unique. Now, I don't know what, that, <laughs> that's probably an OCR problem. A great man makes a great thing. And you get an idea of what it means to be a great man. No, I don't need to keep my file. Almost done. Go to step one. This process is never done. Uh, lastly, um, well, I want to summarize. Articulate a research question. Search the trust for items that you think will answer the question. Uh, download the trust collection file. You have to refine it. Um, then go and get the actual items and then read the items. In this particular case, I uh, read the items. Uh, first, I put them into a structured data set and then I computed against them. And then I actually, I actively asked the questions. I determined whether or not the collection was viable. I look for the word man, what's its context in the word man. And then I use various techniques from, from uh, uh, concordancing, uh, full text indexing, and actual grammatical analysis to uh, address that particular question. Now, if I was asking a different question, like um, where did he go? Or what did he say? Or what did he do? Or what did he think of Mr. Thoreau? or what is the definition of nature? I would answer the questions differently with the tools, but um, I could still come up with an answer that, would, um, that, would, that could help. I also want to advocate that this process, we don't need to share the screen anymore. I'd also like to advocate that some people might um, not think that this is, this is not reading. And uh, my reply is that there's many different types of reading. You read a novel differently than you read a scholarly journal article. You read a scholarly journal article differently than you read a candy bar wrapper. Uh, you read a candy bar wrapper differently than you read an insurance policy. And with the advent of the internet, with the advent of so much content that is bored digitally, it's not possible, it's impractical to read the amount of content that we are expected to read as academics and really get your brain around it thoroughly. And therefore this concept of distant reading is a supplement to the traditional reading process. It's a supplement to the close reading process. Um, it, it, the computer can do things that we are unable to do and we are able to do things that the computer can't do. And I am a real strong advocate of not making any sort of artificial intelligence, anything. That's a bad road to hoe. But I do think that you can use computers to supplement your reading process. And this particular thing uh, demonstrated uh, that, that idea. And I'll do one more thing here. I'm gonna share my screen and I'm gonna to go to my desktop and I'm going to go to my PowerPoint slide. I did that part. Thank you very much for your time. And down here at the bottom is a URL that uh, will point you to uh, the very verbose version of my presentation. Ta-da! I'm done. I'm thinking that we do have time for some questions. I know that it, I think there's at least one or two that came in. Melissa, you've probably been tracking on these a bit. It looks like one came in, Eric, that's just looking for a link to the distant reader toolbox. Uh, is well, that available? Yes, of course there is. Um, <laughs> let's see here. The reader, the, the toolbox uh, URL is long and ugly. I will paste it into the chat. Let's see now, type here and then say, send to anyone in the meeting and go. That was an easy question. Come on, guys. <laughs> I'll put it back to you. 
to what degree do you all think that there needs to be an additional way to read the massive amounts of content that we are expected to consume? And if you do, then how do you suggest we do it? to do a vote. I have no idea. <laughs> well, Eric, I'm a, I'm a traditionalist. So I, as I do any research on the old West, um, I just do it the old way where you find, think you find the books and then you go through each page. And I know the way you're showing is an, a, an alternative way that can help us narrow down it a little bit quicker. So I appreciate you uh, sharing this because um, when I was doing some Old West research in Hathi, it's like, wow, I, I can get a thousand books. And it's like, which one is specifically going to help me? Uh, with my issue it's like okay I only have like limited time to, re to like 20 hours a week to read like maybe 10. That's exactly the problem that the reader is intended to help with. Here in library land we tell people go use such and such and so and so bibliographic index. Great. You So you search uh, JSTOR uh, and you put in all the right words and you put in all the right syntax and you use all the right Boolean logic. Everything is correct, and you end up with 200 journal articles. Well, I'm supposed to be thorough. Which ones do I really need to read? I don't have the time to do that. The reader is intended to supplement that process uh, and, and allow you to peruse the content as very broadly. And then it also helps you then narrow down this one. These are themes in the whole corpus. These are how ideas have ebbed and flowed over time in the whole corpus. And these are the ones that I need to read closely. The problem really isn't the reader. The problem is in the case of Hadi Trot or in the case of JSTOR, actually getting the articles. It's very difficult to click, 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 and download 200 items. It's very difficult. It, it, our systems aren't designed to do that. We have another question. How often do you use this process when helping students with a research question? I use a flavor of this almost all the time. Um, what happens is, is that uh, I will ask them to ac acquire their corpus, get the content, do whatever you can. And sometimes I help them actually getting the content, but you get the content. And then I help them create this data set type of thing. And then it's often true that their particular research question or particular problem does not fit exactly within the tool. Uh, I have a, a, a uh, star nose screwdriver, but they need a flat head screwdriver. And consequently, I modify the tool to do the thing. So the tool, the reader often um, uh, form, forms a foundation and then I build on top of it. So uh, it, I usually use some flavor of this, but it's not the be all end all. It's a it's the framework. It's the beginning. It's a it's, it's overall structure of a of a research process. And and then these research pro these research questions often go for months at a time. Uh, so I, I establish a relationship and I do the information interview sorts of thing, and I learn what they're doing and I, I help them to the best I can. Hachitrust searches in this way provide answers to questions, but is Hachitrust comprehensive enough to ensure that the answers you get to your question isn't partial or inaccurate? You can't. 
uh, that's always going to be the case. If I understand the question correctly, um, your, your answers are always going to be uh, limited by the domain of the uh, content that you uh, acquire to begin with. Again, if I'm doing some sort of research paper and I base my paper on these 15 articles, but those other 20 uh, also help answer the question, then I didn't really good, do a very good job and I needed to uh, acquire other particular content. On the other hand, the trust is very good for doing things like finding all the complete works of Charles Dickens. He's not making any more items. <laughs> you can create a comprehensive authoritative list of uh, 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 Charles, Dickens item, Charles Dickens items and then do that good work. It's also possible to do things like find all documents that have been classified as aesthetics and download all those items. Um, and then you can uh, answer questions like what is art? What is beauty? How has the definition of beauty uh, changed over time? What does this third person think about beauty? What does that person think about beauty? And the answers are going to be limited to whatever content that you have. Uh, so kind of sort of the trust isn't going to be able to answer things that are more, more uh, not modern, that's not the right word, but more recent. And we're going to be limited by the, the copyrighted sorts of things. But some big, uh, but some questions, uh, you can use the trust for that and be absolutely wonderful. You're doing great, guys. Using this medium is difficult. Please pipe up. Um, and this can only be used with Hati Trust, correct? It can't be applied no. to like JSTOR. No, that's absolutely not correct. My goal was to, sh to shine a good light on the trust. I have used this tool to do things like download the totality of an electronic journal and analyze the electronic journal. Uh, you can, as long, uh, talk about the reader, which I enjoy talking about, as long as you can get the content, not a link to it, as long as you can get the content and put the content into a directory, the reader will work. Let me say that again. As long as you can get the content, not a link, and put that content into a directory, the reader will work. And you can put PDF documents in that directory, Word documents, HTML files, RSS feeds, XML files, email messages. Uh, uh, now you're not gonna wanna put like images in there because there's no words. <laughs> And you're not probably not going to put Excel spreadsheets in there either uh, because it's probably filled with numbers. But any kind of file and any number of files you can put into a directory and the reader will do it. Uh, I recently got a grant from Microsoft and I was reading the totality of COVID literature and there were about 750,000 articles about COVID. And while I didn't create a study carol out of 750,000 items, I did subsets of them. And you can read thousands, tens of thousands of articles at, at a particular go. Now, the, the more you have, the bigger your computer is going to want to be. But any kind of file, if you can put it into a directory, the reader will work. You have to get the content, but uh, it's not just Hottie Trust, not at all. What part of the processing is done on the Tika server? Um, the, the, the Tika server, which is launched locally on your computer, um, ex extracts plain text from the PDF documents and does its very best to extract authors and titles and dates from things like PDF documents and Word documents and stuff like that. Uh, all, that's what the Tika server does on your local machine. We have a person asking if um, Hati Trust offers any hands-on workshops for those of us who aren't computing specialists to try. And I would say we do have our research center offers, um, does do workshops and we do a call for those a couple times a year that'll watch our newsletter um, for that. And um, we also are planning a 
web um, some webcasts in the future for um, to talk about um, High Trust Research Center. So watch again, watch our newsletter. And if you're not subscribed to our newsletter, please do that. Oh yes, yes, yes. Um, all, all, everything that I demonstrated today uh, can be run on the High Trust Research Center computers. That if you uh, uh, log in and create a connect, uh, a, uh, an account on the High Trust Research Center, um, you can create what they call a virtual machine and everything that I demonstrated today can be used on one of those computers. So you, uh, but it, it will also work on your Macintosh, it'll work on your Windows machine, it'll work on your Linux box. Um, it's supposed to be as cross-platform as possible. Um, but I did think about uh, doing this all in the, in, in, in the trust uh, in computing environment, but that would have added a little extra wrinkle to the whole thing. Fantastic. It looks like questions are winding down. Some resources there. Thank you, Janet, um, for posting some additional information about the Research Center. Um, Janet has joined us this summer as Digital Scholarship Librarian and Assistant Director of Outreach. So I think between Eric's tools and tools at HTRC, hopefully you all can get up and running asking these big questions. And thank you, Eric, very much for giving us that in-depth and also very fascinating <laughs> overview. Um, and to all of you, thank you for coming. I hope you're going to make it to some other sessions this week. We will be following up with a survey. I thank you in advance for letting us know how this session went for you. And we will also be sending out the slides and recording later on this week. So. Thanks to everyone and hope you have a great day. Thank you for the opportunity, folks.